undermine the rule and, of law. And they did. But Absolutely. that's why this, there is this absolute obdurate determination to bring Jerry Hutch back. And it's also the same determination behind what's going on. But I mean, we had we had the same situation impact. many years ago, of course, in Limerick, where you know individuals threatened yeah. the rule of law, and of course that was one of the reasons, of course, that they brought in this idea that you could be set or you could be charged on uh, uh, the testimony of a superintendent. Mm. I mean, and that was for the same reason. So there there has been, you know, throughout the last fifty or sixty years, there's been certain individuals that have threatened the yeah. rule of law, and I suppose the Garda Síochána and the justice system has to make an example of people and say this can't happen. Yeah, and they, and they have to make uh, their own behind bars. Yeah, so. well, and efforts have to be made to make sure that people who are well known and everybody knows these people are involved in crime that they have to be uh, justice has to be served. Otherwise, it just turns into a free for all, I suppose. But, but, but you see, that's the effect of organised crime. Organised crime has got much deeper roots now in our society than ever before. Like we saw that appalling situation where those three thugs were killed. Uh, driving like lunatics uh, there last month, and then you saw that appalling display. Oh, the display! Absolutely, the funeral was outrageous. Went on around that. People just didn't couldn't come out and say what it was, call it for what it was. And perhaps it's too early in the day for me to use the vernacular. I would like to use on them, but like you see, when you see that, the people who were at that uh, at that funeral. The community that supported those thugs, and especially bringing up to an altar a screwdriver which is used to terrorise and injure decent, innocent and elderly people in their homes and terrorise them. They come from a, a sort of a, a subculture community whereby everything they do is perfectly normal. The problem is, can you imagine trying to wear your kids in the communities where these people live and where this behaviour is normalised? But, but isn't, but isn't that what happens? I mean, we used to use the, the term years ago, thugs raising thugs. So, but, but isn't that what happens when you've got a community which sees no wrong in, and you talk about those funerals and we saw the behaviour of the individuals on their motorbikes and stealing the hearse and all that kind of carry on. When you see that kind of behaviour, it's no wonder of these young children of you know nine and ten, particularly young lads, you know, see this behaviour and they think that's normal, and they just they, and they aspire to be like their you know these older people because that's what happens, or isn't it? Cases, like one time, say twenty years ago, thirty years ago, cohorts in society like that within communities were small. You mm-hmm. could identify them. Now you have it spreading like a virus right through the community. And I feel so sorry for the parents trying to rear those kids, trying to keep them on the straight and narrow, trying to keep them away from these thugs and scumbags, because that's all they are. Of course. And, and, and like, but go back to the, the, the Ken and Hutch feud. All of this is part of the same paradigm. And that is why the only response society has is to take them off the streets and put them behind bars for years. Uh, and to t- and, but the problem is, that, as I said, now, the, the weeds will continue to grow. So they'll have to keep coming out every now and again with the big strimmer and cutting them back. And then you will never get at the roots of it. Well, they do. Oh, well, they, all that happens is when these guys go into jail is they pass on the gauntlet. And by the way, and then they operate from jail as well. And we've seen that too. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, oh, sure. Sure. Killigan was in prison for 17 years. He was moving millions of euros worth of Well, where, where is he now? Well, the last time I saw it was a he's video of him being arrested. He's a, he was arrested oh, as no, well. He, he, he turned, popped up on the anniversary of Veronica's murder on WhatsApp, as you would do when you're a, such an unrepentant psychopath. But he uh, he is in Spain awaiting trial for uh, uh, possession of a firearm. You mm. may recall this. Uh, That's this right, yeah. They what? found it buried but, in the side of his house. And yeah. they said it was the, the exact same make and model, coincidentally, as the one used to murder Veronica, but it wasn't the same weapon, obviously. But he is facing charges for... for uh, the, trafficking in drugs and guns um, and the, I think the max he can face over there is five or six years. He'd get 15 here but sometimes over there they give them a present. But having said that, he is an elderly man, 69 uh, and uh, he'll, you know, he's back, he'll be back where he belongs he, uh, and it goes to show as well that prison, prison certainly never ever uh, rehabilitates these guys. No. But going back to Jerry Hutch, the thing about Jerry Hutch that, uh, really for me as the as unofficial biographer and somebody's been chronic in his life is it is so it is it is a surprise in one way but unsurprised in other ways because they all end up going back to what they were about but he is the last man I would uh, he was the only man I thought would have actually made it true to die uh, a, a, an old man in his sleep because he was so clever and knew when to get out. And the sins, as, he's, as he has told his associates, the only reason he got involved in this and came out of retirement was because his family was under attack and he had to protect his family. Uh, that's the way he feels and that's his rationale. I don't think he'd be telling the judges that in the special criminal court. No. 
Um, but he will fight this extradition. It'll only be a couple of months. He'll be back. I'll be on trial in about a year, year and a half. I would say within the next two years, we'll be listening and looking at Daniel Kinahan. Maybe in about another three, four years now, we could, if we're still alive and we're still employed, we could <laughs> still be talking about, uh, you know, the outcome of this case. My God, didn't it take 10 years? But wasn't it worth it in the end? At least they were got. And by the way, Jerry Hutch, by the way, go back to Jerry Hutch. Was Jerry Hutch ever in jail? Oh, God, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, he was, okay, because there was a yeah, suggestion. Yeah, exactly. Somebody suggested to me a while ago he was never oh, actually in jail with anything. Oh, he did. He, I, I, I was just scanning my book there, and I can't remember exactly, but I think it was 1984. A long time ago, yeah. Conviction. Right. Uh, yeah, he has never been in prison or custody since. Right. Um, so he he's going back to a changed world there because he will inevitably be spending time in prison. Pen- no, but sorry, there, when all the little losers in jail will all look up to him, he'll be there like, he'll oh, be like their hero if he did go to jail. They will look up to him. They will look up to him. And, of course, if they had any brains at all, they'd look up to him and say, Jesus, this is what happens. If this is the cleverest and the most cunning and the most capable of all of us, then Jesus, we, there isn't much hope for us. I think it's yeah. mature and move on. But Okay, okay. You know, well, this, well, it's, it's, a, it's an intriguing story, Paul. And I know you outlaw in a lot of it in the, in the autobiography. And the book is, uh, it's called, uh, the, it was published last year, by the way. And, um, oh, sorry, what's the name of the book again, Paul? My apologies. The monk. The Monk. Oh, yes. Sorry. The yeah. I didn't call it Night Boyle. Like <laughs> the Monk, the life and crimes of Ireland's most en- enigmatic gang boss. Yeah. Sounds like, it sounds like, it sounds like a good read because I need to learn a bit, bit more about the man because I, I, I find him intriguing. Right. The I, in the I mean, he's an intriguing individual, Paul, and we need, sure. to, le- we need to learn more about him. Yeah. I have to admit that I have a bit of a soft spot. Only purely from the point of view that you know, looking at some of some of the things he did, uh, I'm not talking about his crimes, but some things he did for some people. He he did. Uh, you you have to ask yourself this: Why does nobody in the north inner city have a bad word to say about him? Uh, it's very. Did, um, did you? By the way, just finally, did you ever sit down with him and talk face to face to him? Oh, yeah, I had a point with him. And is I mean, leaving aside the crimes, you know, that we know he may or may not be responsible for, or you know, what he is being charged with now and being brought back to Ireland for in the book of evidence. What was he like? Is, I mean, is he is he just is he just salt of the earth? No, you know, it's calm. not a term they use, salt of the earth. The first, the first time I met him was when they opened Corinthians back in 1998, and I was invited, but it was all orchestrated and, and choreographed. Because as soon as I walked in, I'd just written a book when I'd done the chapter on him in Gangland, the book called Gangland, and. Uh, I was invited, but the guards were all there, and they were invited to go. It was like it, it, was, it was an extraordinary event. I described it in the book, but you know, there were all the local community leaders, uh, mm. politicians, every criminal around the place. It was like an East End. It was like it, it, an ex. It all looked like extras from the craze, uh, and <laughs> Jerry Hutch. And the guards were all there. It was a community effort, criminal on both sides of the of the fence. They were all there, but suddenly the crowd parted ways. It was like the strangest thing ever. And there was Jerry Hutch standing with a point of in his hands. And I said, Jesus, and, and to say hello to me and shook hands with me. And I said, How are you doing? How's it going, Jerry? And they, he said, oh, Grand, do you have a point? And suddenly I asked, I said, I have a point of Heineken. Heineken, Heineken in, sort of materialized in my hand within <laughs> seconds. And then, uh, uh, like he's a sinister individual. He, like he looked through your soul. And when he's looking at you, but I said, first question, I said, Jesus, I thought you didn't drink. Yeah. He says, I have the odd one. Oh, that's grand. So then we started talking about the, the boxing. It was all quite friendly, but it, 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 the, the next few times, it wasn't quite so friendly. And then, yeah, there's an undertone to it, isn't it? You need to stop writing about me, Paul, or else. <laughs> well, I really pissed them off through the years. And, and, yeah, I'm sure, sure you have. Them. I'm sure you've pissed off a few people throughout the years, to be honest with you. <laughs> <laughs> but like, somebody texted and said, Jerry Hutch was a nice man. He was my mother's landlord in Buckingham Street, Dublin 1. He collected the rent off us, and he bought shopping for some of the tenants who were less off. That's right. That's right, yeah, yeah, that's right, absolutely. Yeah, so uh, charitably, he just bought yeah. shopping for people, yeah. Now, yeah. at the same time, though, if he came into your house or my house and we were working in a place with an AK-47, he wouldn't have a nice thing to say about him, but that's what I'm saying. <laughs> that, that is the, the, the inherent contradictions about and the paradox around these characters, you know. Like, for example, this is very important, I think, and I've studied this for 30 years uh, in every sense from a sociological point of view. Jerry Hutch's kids, uh, Jerry Hutch insisted and, and made sure, and he's the only criminal I can think of that did this ever, that he insisted that his kids stayed away. He brought them out to live in Santas, where he was an incongruity, a mi- million miles away from his cultural base in, in the north inner city. But he brought them to private schools, fee-paying 
private school paid for now, in fairness. Yeah. With the largest from the various expropriations. Yeah, of course. And banks and stuff around the place. But he, he kept them on the straight and narrow to such an extent that they're, very, they're stand-up... Decent. Members of the community. Yeah, but he got he's the only one that I've ever come across has done that and none of those kids have ever featured in crime and he kept them away from crime and I always think there is something in that as well um, none of this by the way mitigates for the horror and the outrage of what happened and what he's been charged with and none of it but at the same time it is interesting it's part of the reason why he takes such a character uh, and his kids are doing really, really well in their chosen careers. Now, in fairness, they use different names and stuff like that, but they're stand-up yeah. good citizens. Uh, and, like, I, I wouldn't even go into what one of them does, but by God, uh, top of the range in their particular profession. In their field, yeah. I mean, well, look, that that's good to hear. Well, look, I, I have to go into a break. Listen, Paul, it's been very interesting, actually. It's intriguing listening to it. And now I'm have to, I'll have to go and get the book now. And the, so I'm not just giving it a random plug. I think I need to go and read it myself. It's called The Monk, The Life and Crimes of Ireland's Most Enigmatic Gang Boss. And it's by Paul Williams. Listen, Paul, thank you very much indeed. And I appreciate You're you coming on the air today. To All right, there you go. Paul Williams, that sounds like a really good read, to be honest with you. Uh, an absolutely great read uh, because he, I, I find Jerry Hutch to be an intriguing character. I well, I didn't say I said, when I say I met him, I saw him once. He came into a radio station I was working in once. I can't tell you the reason why, but he came into it wasn't for an interview, but he came into a radio station I was working for once, which was a very interesting day. And when he walked in, it was like this kind of larger than life character. Even though he's quite a small man, by the way, he's not a tall man by any stretch of the imagination, but. Because you have heard so much about him, and I suppose if you've watched the Veronica Garrett movie, he portrays, or they portray him certainly in the movie and in the books, as this ordinary, decent criminal. A man who never got really involved in drugs or anything like that. He seems to live live a reasonably healthy lifestyle. Um, Didn't directly order the killing of anybody, unlike many of the criminals that were around at the time, the general and others that we would have seen around at the time who were scum. This guy operated almost like the Michael Caine type character, if you know what I mean in those movies. The clever guy. You know, the guy who would be just in it for the money. And that that's the way he was seen uh, and has been seen throughout the years. Well, just to remind you again, he has been arrested. He's in, been arrested in Spain. He's been kept in custody. And this is on the foot of a European arrest warrant. And uh, a file on the case was submitted to the Director of Public Prosecutions. Uh, back in the Guardi produced and have served books of evidence on four men, including former Sinn Fein councillor, who were charged in connection with that murder. Real people, real opinions, real talk radio. The multi award winning Niall Boylan Show. Classic hit.